All right. So thanks for coming, everyone. And we're going to get started now. So I'm Annie Kremhout. I'm the director of the Hubbard Pool Library. And thank you for joining us tonight. We have a very interesting um, guest speaker tonight. Her name is Kate McBrien. She currently serves as the Maine State Archivist, and she oversees the state, the Maine State Government's Archives and Records Management Programs, and as curator of the award-winning exhibition, uh, Malaga Island Fragmented Lives, Kate is also an, an, a historian for the Malaga Island community. She previously held positions as Chief Curator and Director of Public Engagement at the Maine Historical Society and as the Curator of Historical Collections for the Maine State Museum. So, Kate, if you are ready to Hi. take over. Yeah, thank you so much, Andy. I really appreciate it. Hello, everybody. Thank you for, for joining us tonight. Um, as she said, my name is Kate McBrien. I'm the Maine State Archivist. Uh, and I'm gonna to talk to you tonight about Malaga Island, which is a small community on an island right off the coast of Pittsburgh. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen so that you can actually see some photos from the community. Uh, and we'll chat a bit about what over time we learned about the community. Okay, can everyone see that all right? So, awesome. Uh, Malaga Island, well, Malaga Island is the topic uh, for tonight. Uh, I do want to just explain a little bit about sort of who, who I am, where I, I come from with all of this. Um, as Annie mentioned, I am uh, the state archivist, which means I run the, the Maine State Archives for all of you, uh, for the people of Maine. Uh, we are uh, the agency within state government that is tasked with the responsibility of collecting all uh, government created records uh, and deciding which ones need to be preserved for history and making all of those accessible to you. So in short, it basically means that we are your key to a transparent. We make sure that we've got the collection, the records available so that you know what your government is doing and has been doing in the past on behalf of Maine people. So that's kind of what I'm doing now. Luckily, what I did um, some years ago related to Malaga Island was I, I used and accessed a lot of the records of uh, Maine State Archives to understand the history and the government's role in the community there. This was all in preparation for an exhibit uh, that I curated at the Maine State Museum called Malaga Island Fragmented Lives. Uh, and this was really the first museum exhibition to dive into the history uh, of Malaga Island to try to share it uh, with the people. Mostly because this had been an, a forgotten island. Uh, the, many of the people who lived in the region of Pittsburgh, many of the people who are descended from those who lived on Malaga Island, never heard of it, didn't know where they came from, didn't know the history. Um, so it took uh, quite a few years and, and the efforts of many people to try to uncover that history and, and realize again uh, what had actually happened on that island off of Pittsburgh. So to fill you in, Malaga is uh, located at the mouth of the New Meadows River uh, in Pittsburgh. It's a really tiny island. If you're familiar with sort of the Sebasco area, the Sebasco Resort, it's right off of that area um, of Pittsburgh. It's about 42 at 42 acres is very rocky, scruffy, covered in pine. Uh, this is actually what it looks like. Uh, and there's really, there's several theories for how the community who came to live on Malaga Island got there. Most of them trace back to one man. His name was Benjamin Darling. He was an African-American man, probably a former slave, uh, who purchased Horse Island right next to Malaga. And he purchased that in 1794. He married a white woman named Sarah Proverbs and they raised their family on Horse Island. In the mid 1850s, his children sold Horse Island. We're not really sure why, but they sold it and they ended up scattering to sort of the nearby islands. Um, and that's really what people did quite often uh, in the late 1700s, early 1800s in Maine. 
Islands were not desirable places to live. It's not like today where if you buy an island, it's you know really expensive and really amazing. Islands were places where it was really difficult to live. You were separated from community. You were separated from all the resources that you needed. Uh, so for the most part, people tried not to live on islands very much if they could help it. Um, they actually would tend to put sheep out to graze on islands, that kind of thing. So islands were available. And if someone wanted to set up a home there, it was pretty easy to just set up home and nobody questioned it. Nobody else wanted the space. So that's really what Benjamin Darling's descendants did is they kind of set up home on neighboring islands um, and would raise their families in those locations. From what we can tell, records are not very clear, but our best guess is that the first um, people to live on Malaga Island, uh, the first of Benjamin Darling's descendants, uh, were the Griffin family. And they probably moved there to the northern part of the island in around 1863. Um, and pretty soon, once they set up home, uh, family members and cousins and a sister and her family, that kind of thing, uh, they all joined and they set up a, a series of houses on the north end of Malaga that you can see here. And it was the north end of the island that they settled on because that's the only beach, that's the only place that's really easy to land on. Um, and you're still very close to the mainland. So life on Malaga Island was really um, typical for any main island in uh, the late 19th century. Members of the community who lived there tended to be rather financially poor. Uh, they earned a living from the sea, uh, but they also, most of them also had other jobs on the mainland, sort of odd jobs, laboring jobs, and then they all, everyone fished. Um, but really what made this community unique and different from a lot of their neighbors is that it was a community of different races, living together, marrying, raising families. So you had black people and white people living together on this island. And that made them to the mainland stand out as different. And in the late 19th century, uh, that was seen as an unusual style of life. Um, and so, occasionally some attention uh, was paid to them. But generally what we have found is that they lived like all their other communities uh, surrounding them, just like mainland, uh, main, mainland Phippsburg, everybody fished, everybody uh, worked hard, everybody had a few jobs to, to get by. We're able to, to know so much of this because there were some documents left behind, some, some evidence of how the people lived. While we have the evidence of how they really lived, unfortunately, at the same time as the community was living there, there were a lot of myths that very quickly grew up about this secluded mixed race community. There were stories going up and down the coast of Maine about this island community that was filled with thieves, that there was inbreeding, that there was illiteracy. Um, they actually would spread tales of a degenerate colony where incest and wife swapping was common. I even found one newspaper article that said that the children on the island had blunted horns growing out of their head and that they were living in tunnels under the homes. And then postcards like this one that you see here were sold nationwide. Uh, they showed very pitiful scenes of, of the people who called Malaga Island home. This is a real photo postcard of people who lived on Malaga. Uh, the elderly woman here, I believe is Elizabeth Darling. And I do know that the child sitting on her lap was Pearl Tripp. Um, so those were real people who lived on Malaga, but they would always be shown and spoke of in a way um, that was very derogatory to them. However, reality was really quite different. This is also a photograph of, fa of a family who lived on Malaga Island. Families certainly struggled to meet their basic needs, and, but they also built their homes. They educated their children as much as possible. They interacted with the mainland community regularly and peacefully um, and whenever needed. So how do we know all of this about the people who lived on Malaga? Because like I said, it was really a secret for a long time. People buried this history. They stopped talking about it. Well, one of the ways that we began to uncover some of the true story of the people who lived on Malaga was through an archeological dig conducted by archeologists from the University of Southern Maine. They spent about eight years on Malaga Island digging at the sites of three homes. They dug at the McKinney House site the Griffin House site, 
and the Eason house site. And you can see here, this is a stratigraphy of the, the dig spots. And it wasn't just soil that they were digging into, but it was shell middens because based on photographic evidence, they could pinpoint where the houses were located. And they found that the community members mostly built their homes right on top of shell middens created by indigenous communities hundreds of years before. And what they found in those shell middens, in those dig spots, uh, was that generally the island community owned the same types of things as all their mainland neighbors, and they really lived and worked in the same way. Many of their possessions were secondhand. Ceramics tended to be styles that were really popular from decades before. Although a few families like the Eason's um, had some things that were very current for the 20th century, early 20th century, like this bowl, which was a style popular around 1905. The archeologists also found that they used clay pipes, uh, which were really common in the 18th and early 19th centuries. They found evidence of fragments of clay pipes, hundreds of them all over the island. They also found textiles and fragments of shoes, evidence that the people who lived on Malaga used their things up until there was really nothing else that could be done with them before they threw them out. So let's take a moment to really look at who some of the folks were who lived on Malaga Island, who some of these people were who called it home. First, we'll look at the Griffin uh, family because they were the first ones to live on Malaga. Henry and Tina Griffin, uh, like I said, were most likely uh, the first to, to set up home on Malaga around 1863, we think. Uh, Henry Griffin had grown up in Phippsburg. Tina, uh, his wife, was her, her maiden name was Darling. So she was Tina Darling. So that's that Darling family connection back to Benjamin Darling. Uh, she was born in 1809. Uh, and like I said, she was the, the granddaughter of Benjamin Darling. So she had grown up on Horse Island and then Bear Island right next to Malaga. So when she married Henry Griffin, they set up home on Malaga right next door. The McKinney's um, were uh, the next family, we believe, to live on the island. They set up home right next to the Griffins. James Eli McKinney, uh, he was white, of Scotch-Irish descent. He had grown up in Phippsburg as well. He married Salome Griffin. Um, she was the, the sister of Henry uh, Griffin. So again, that family, family connection. Uh, and this was actually his second marriage. And uh, Salome Griffin had actually uh, spent some years on Bear Island before she went to Malaga. Their daughter, Louisa McKinney, is the first recorded birth on Malaga Island. She was born there in 1871. That's who you see here. She spent her entire childhood on Malaga. And when she married, uh, she and her husband built a home and raised their children on Malaga as well. You see her three sons pictured here with her. James Eli McKinney uh, was actually well known in the press and well known regionally uh, as the sort of community leader, he became known as the king of Malaga Island. And that's a term that's very commonly given to fishing communities. It was a term uh, put on the person who tended to be the best fisherman, who ended up leading a fishing community and uh, acting as their spokesperson. That's really what Jim McKinney did. So when we find newspaper articles about Malaga Island, if you ever see someone quoted from Malaga, it's usually Jim McKinney. Um, because he acted as the spokesperson for the community. It's my own personal theory uh, that he was also the white person living on the island. So I can imagine that he's the one that the newspaper reporters were, were more comfortable speaking with and probably spoke to more often as well. Uh, like I said, he was known throughout the region. Uh, he actually performed his fiddle uh, up and down the New Meadows River. Uh, so he was known for his musical skills as well. In fact, his obituary in 1916 described him this way. I'll read you a quote. Jim McKinney was perhaps the most picturesque character that lived on the little emerald island of Malaga. He seemed to possess a little more education than the others on the island, and they accordingly carried all their troubles to him, and he settled them." Unquote. Another family who lived on Malaga Island were the Eason's. 
John Eason, who you see here, was a stonemason and a carpenter. But just like everyone else on the island, he also fished. They all fished. He was known regionally for his fine singing voice. He would perform in the area as well. And he was nicknamed the deacon because uh, anytime the islanders couldn't make it to the mainland to attend church, he would preach the, to them on the island. He married Rosella Griffin, uh, who was again related to the Griffins and hence the Darlings. And they lived on Malaga Island having married in 1886. What I love about you, this picture of Rosella Griffin here, as you can see, she's holding her cat. So it's a little glimpse on their pets as well. Now this photo of the Eason standing in front of their house is really very interesting because we actually know the exact date it was taken. This photograph was taken by a commercial photographer named Herman Bryant who worked in the Gardner area. Um, he visited Malaga Island and took this image, which was a glass plate negative, and the sleeve that the glass plate negative um, is stored in, he wrote the date he took it. He took it on July 20th, 1911. Now, by writing down that date, we actually know a few things. We know this is the Eason's. Uh, we know that just six days before he took this photograph, it was reported in the newspaper that Maine's attorney general had decided that Malaga Island was owned by a family named the Perrys in Phippsburg. And then 11 days after this photograph is taken, we know, again, the newspaper reported that the Perry family was evicting the community on Malaga Island. So it's this little window, this picture was taken in this small slice of time when the people on Malaga were probably hearing that the state has decided someone else owns the land that they live on, but they haven't quite heard yet what's gonna happen to them and what that means. So you have to wonder sort of, what are they thinking? What are they doing posing for this photographer? What could be going through their minds at the time this image was taken? So let's look a little bit at sort of what got to that point. Why, how did the state of Maine get involved in this little tiny island community of like 45 people? Um, and what led to the state's eviction of the community who lived on Malaga? Well, just like anything, it's it's complicated. There's many different things that happened all at the same time. And, and all of those things happening really impacted the Malaga Island community. One of them was that in the uh, turn of the 20th century, Maine was really seeing a rapidly changing economy uh, for a number of reasons. There was a decline in the shipbuilding industry, which was a major industry for the Phippsburg area. Um, people no longer needed wooden built ships. Uh, when they were transitioning to steamship and trains. So because of that, you also have a decline in all the support industries, all the ropes and sail making and barrels. So really the economy in Phippsburg got hit really hard at the turn of the 20th century. At the same time that's happening, there was a decline in the amount of fish that was available. So there was bigger competition among fishing communities. And so as jobs disappeared and the economy became uh, more difficult, more and more people up and down the coast of Maine turned to their towns for financial assistance. This is before we had any um, larger statewide or federal programs uh, to help uh, people in need. People would go straight to their town uh, and their town would support them. But in doing so, because this was a widespread impact, economic impact, there was uh, more and more of the town's budget was being put towards the care of the poor in their community. So as the coast of Maine was dealing with this up and down, uh, Maine began to look to tourism as being our new industry, the one that would kind of save Maine again, bring more people, bring more money and more industry back into the state. At the same time that all of that is happening, uh, the eugenics movement began to thrive in Maine. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the eugenics movement, uh, eugenicists were really concerned with the purity of the Anglo-Saxon gene pool. They believed that all social evils such as like pauperism, crime, prostitution, illiteracy, these were all inherited traits uh, through genes, through a family that could then be controlled. If you can control the genes and you can control how someone um, procreates and a family 
grows and continues, then you can control all those social problems as well. That was the basis of the uh, theory of eugenesis. And this became a widely accepted uh, scientific belief uh, to the point where it was adopted by governments, by scientists, by medical professionals, by the um, education uh, industry in the state. It, this was sort of the leading thought at this time at the early uh, 1900s. And so you began to have um, institutions, medical tracking, you had forms like this one, which actually uh, is a eugenics art created for a family who lived on Malaga Island. All the Fs and in black, those are marking people deemed feeble-minded, uh, which was part of the, the eugenics process um, and tracking who's related to who and, and the different generations of assigned feeble-mindedness. So part of the eugenicist belief was that one way to fix all of this is if you had concentrations of people with these social problems as they saw it, as the eugenicists saw it, uh, that the one, one way to deal with that is to actually uh, separate the communities, break them up. Along with the eugenics movement, uh, we actually uh, coined several, several terms. Um, these were actually medical diagnoses that were created by the eugenics uh, system. Terms like idiot, moron, imbecile, words that we all use today on a pretty regular basis were actually uh, medical diagnoses that were developed for the eugenics movement to um, be applied to someone who, who eugenicists believed uh, were not very intelligent, uh, were deficient in some way or deemed unfit for society in some way. I will say this is the chart of the uh, low functioning range um, in the eugenics movement, but they also uh, termed, um, created terms such as gifted child. That also comes from the eugenics movement. And those are still terms that we still use today. Along with the eugenics movement and all this focus on how to improve society and, and uh, fix any of society's problems. Uh, a lot of that often comes with missionary work in America. Uh, so for Malaga Islands, the missionaries uh, who worked there were George and Lucy Lane. They were residents of Massachusetts, uh, from Malden, Massachusetts, uh, who purchased a home on uh, Horse Island. Um, it was Harbor Island by the time they bought it. Um, and they purchased a home there. And there's actually a letter from George and George Lane in 1911. He wrote to a, a friend saying, uh, we built our summer house on the north end of Harbor Island and being interested in looking after people who need, who need help found what I was looking for on Malaga Island. So he bought his summer home and then he looked for, for some work for some people who needed help. And he decided Malaga Island were the people he needed to help. And so the Lanes went to work. They focused their efforts on educating the children and teaching moral values to the women of Malaga Island. Uh, they actually opened the island's first school in 1906. They operated it from one room of the McKinney House, which was considered sort of the best house on the island. Their daughter, Cora, served as, as the school's teacher. So they opened it in 1906. By the next year, the school had grown to 14 students. And so the class had to move to the larger room in the McKinney house. The Lanes also actively raised funds to build a permanent school on the island and to help pay for food and clothing. So by just the following year, by 1908, a new school building was actually opened on the island, which you see here. And the state of Maine sent a full-time teacher to live on the island and teach uh, the children there. The island school was actually so successful that one mainland student paid tuition to attend. And as you can see, the children did receive an education. They learned to read and write. They were taught mathematics and history. And actually, according to one letter that I've seen, they were introduced to some trades as well. This, what you see right here, is a letter from Abby Marks to uh, Mrs. Lane, the, the missionary Mrs. Lane, asking if she will come to visit soon. So soon after, um, 
soon after the school was opened, uh, the state really, because they were beginning to send a teacher there, um, they were getting more and more involved with the community. Um, actually, just a few years before the state opened, uh, the state opened the school, the state actually became involved by um, making the residents of Malaga Island wards of the state. Uh, the town of Phippsburg had petitioned the island, uh, first tried to say that they actually thought Malaga Island wasn't part of Phippsburg. It actually was part of Harpsville. So Harpsville should be financially responsible for the people of Malaga. Uh, the state denied that claim. Um, but what they did instead is instead of just forcing Phippsburg um, to oversee the care of the residents on Malaga, they made the residents wards of the state, which meant that the state actually um, hired an agent uh, who would go in and check in on the people, oversee their care, make sure they had food, pay any bills on their behalf. And so they uh, appointed George Pease, who was a resident of Phippsburg, uh, to act as the agent. He did this for several years. Uh, but not too long after the school was open, you know, the, the state was getting more and more involved. And I think the question must have come up um, in the executive council at the time. We used to our state government used to be, we had a governor and an executive council to run the daily operations of the state. And the executive council asked uh, Agent Pease to make recommendations on what really should happen with Malaga Island at that point. Um, should they continue as is? Should something else uh, happen? So Pease did this. He wrote um, a multi-page report to the executive council and the governor of Maine and in, in that he described each of the people who lived on Malaga. Um, he used very racist terminology and a lot of eugenics based terminology. He included his opinion on the race and the intelligence level and the work ethic of every person who lived on Malaga. And this was his official report to the executive council. The last couple of, of pages are what you see here in which he made suggestions on what he shot, what he thought should happen with the island. He actually suggested that the state of Maine should own the island. And he writes here, state should own island. It could then prevent people from settling there and turn off the undesirable ones. Then he goes through and he lists what should happen to each of the families. That you could buy someone out, you can order someone else to leave. Um, and then he even says, you can place Sadie Johnson in the Bath Military and Naval Orphan Asylum. You can place Mrs. Annie Parker in the home for, for feeble-minded. She is a fit subject, is what he wrote. He also suggested that a two and a half year old child of Lizzie Marks could be sent to a Mrs. Hunt in Portland because she wants the child. Then he said uh, there were a few older people who could live, um, who could actually stay on the island um, because they are not well and they probably will not live long anyway. And this was his official report to the island. What I find very interesting about this report is it's not just a recommendation of what should happen, but it's a document showing how the state was viewing the people who lived on this island, not as individuals with their own lives and their own needs, not as a community, uh, but the state was really looking at them as a problem that had to be dealt with and how do you deal with a problem? And that's really the tone and the information shared in this report. Upon receipt of the report, Governor Playstead at the time um, visited Malaga Island with his executive council. It was such a big event that there was actually a postcard made of, of uh, Governor Playstead landing on Malaga Island. He wanted, and, and the whole council wanted to see the island for themselves. They reported after that visit that they were encouraged by the progress of the children in the school, but that they were not convinced the community would ever accept a middle class style of living, is how they put it. Um, the governor actually wrote um, or reported in, in the newspaper that he felt the best plan would be to burn down the shacks with all their filth. So soon after his visit, uh, he actually ordered the attorney general to decide on the ownership of the island. And that's when uh, the state ruled that the island was owned by the Perry family of Phippsburg. Uh, the Perrys uh, owned, according to the state, held the last known deed of the island. 
they hadn't paid taxes on it in decades. And the Perrys who lived in Phippsburg, everyone knew that if people lived on Malaga, nobody had ever tried to evict them for the 50 years before this. Uh, but the state claimed that the Perrys owned the island. Uh, according to newspaper accounts, Henry Griffin thought uh, that he, he claimed that he actually bought all or part of Malaga at one point, uh, but there was never any paperwork to prove it. Uh, so the state disregarded that. And so within just a couple of months, the Perry family uh, filed uh, papers in court to have the island residents evicted. The uh, reports of the Committee for the Council of the State of Maine uh, for 1911-1912 actually devotes an entire section to Malaga Island. This is the reports of the Executive Council. They reported uh, for this year, there has been heretofore, and some are existing at the present time, certain pauper colonies that have been for years a disgrace to the adjacent communities and a blot upon the state. We refer particularly to Malaga Island, Athens, and Frenchboro. They then went on to describe their decision to evict the islanders this way. After viewing conditions, it was decided at a council meeting shortly after that the good of the state and the cause of humanity demanded that the colony be broken up and the people segregated. And that to prevent further squatting, the state decided it should actually hold title to the island. So again, very eugenics based language and theories. Now, Portland and Boston philanthropists had been working with the missionaries, with the Lanes um, for years, uh, providing financial support for the people who lived on Malaga. Um, and they became deeply concerned about the Perry's, flame, uh, Perry's claims to the island and, that, and with the state's efforts to evict the community residents. Uh, there's actually a, lots of letters from these philanthropists held at the Phippsburg Historical Society, where they talk about writing to a lawyer, um, trying to advocate on behalf of the people of, of Malaga to see if there was something they could do to stop uh, the eviction from the island. Uh, but the lawyers all basically reported, you're not going to win. Uh, you can't fight the state. There's really nothing you can do. This letter also that, that you see here, this one was written by Mrs. Augusta Hunt, uh, who was a very wealthy, influential woman in Portland uh, who'd been involved with Malaga Island for a while. And I think her letter uh, in August of 1911 really demonstrates part of the way that the philanthropists and the missionaries were approaching uh, the people of Malaga. In this letter, she wrote, Dear Mrs. Lane, I think you ought to know that on Friday next, the governor and council with three ladies are expecting to visit Malaga Island. We leave by special steamer at nine o'clock. Please do not let the people on the island know of this visit, as I am anxious to have the men see conditions just as they are and without comment. It would be all right for Cora to have the children in the school building when we arrive. That might be the best way for the men to see. I don't want them dressed up but if possible, clean in general appearance. If we have them looking unusually well on the island, it might seem as if we had exaggerated their needs, but you and Mr. Lane can give the men just what they wish to know and in information. So that kind of shows you this, the way the philanthropists were approaching this community, that they weren't working with them, they weren't talking with them necessarily. It was very much a, we don't need to have anyone talk to the people who lived on Malaga. You can do the talking for them. We don't want them too cleaned up. We don't want to look like we're exaggerating the problem. So just don't tell them at all. And I don't know about you, but if the governor was coming to visit my house, I would kind of want to know ahead of time and maybe do some cleaning up, picking up a little bit, um, make sure I'm not wearing you know, my sweatpants, things like that. Uh, but the folks on Malaga Island never had that opportunity. They weren't told before um, because they were supposed to look as rugged as possible. On December 9th of 1911, a local doctor and member of Governor Playstead's Executive Council signed papers committing Annie Parker and the entire Marks family to the newly opened Maine School for the Feeble-Minded. This was a eugenics-based institution in West Pownall um, where you could separate, the state would actually institutionalize people to separate them from communities. 
Then after that, uh, the state of Maine purchased Malaga Island. They paid $471 for it. They then told uh, the residents that they had to vacate the island by July 1st, 1912. Some Malaga Island, island residents were given a token sum of money for their houses, but none of them were provided with alternative houses or alternative land to go to. When Agent Pease arrived on the island on July 1st of 1912 to evict everyone, he actually uh, showed up with a sheriff ready to forcibly evict people, but he found that the island was already deserted. Everyone had already left, but even better than that, they not only left, they also took all their houses with them. They dismantled them and took them to the mainland. And what I love about that is that's really a statement by people who don't have a voice in a situation, who don't have a lot of control about what's happening to them, but what they could control is when they leave and how they leave. Uh, so that's what the community on Malaga Island did. At the end of 1912, uh, after the eviction was complete, the state of Maine sold Malaga Island to the highest bidder for $1,650. Right before they sold it, uh, the state of Maine uh, exhumed and moved the cemetery uh, from Malaga Island and reburied them at Pineland, the main school for the feeble-minded. They took the remains of 17 people from the cemetery on Malaga Island. They combined them into five zinc-lined caskets and they sent them all to be buried at the main school for the feeble-minded. Here at the Maine State Archives, we actually hold uh, the cemetery burial book for the Maine School for Pineland. Uh, and it marks which bodies were combined into one plot. So one plot might have eight bodies, another one has three, another one has one. One family that was, that was particularly devastated by the events on Malaga Island were the Marks family. Here you see Jacob Conrad Marks, uh, known as Jake Marks. He married Hannah Darling, or Ab I'm sorry, Abby Darling. Um, so again, that Darling connection. You can see Abby and Jake and their family here in front of their home on Malaga Island. They had four children. And in, they were the family who in December of 1911, um, the state institutionalized into the main school for the feeble-minded. The state sent the entire Marx family um, and an elderly woman named Mrs. Annie Parker. The, again, the Maine State Archives right here, we have the uh, patient records for the entire Marx family um, from their time at Pineland. And according to the records, all the Marx family uh, were institutionalized based on diagnoses as low-grade moron or imbecile middle grade. And these were their medical terms. Only two members of the family uh, were actually able to leave the main school for the feeble-minded. All the others died there. Uh, Jake, the father, died within a month of being at the main school for the feeble-minded and his son, James, not too long afterwards. Lottie uh, was released in 1925. Uh, she and her mother, Abby, moved to Bath, where they worked as maids uh, in different households there, and they also lived in, in those homes. You'll notice at the bottom a listing for Willie Marks. Willie uh, was that two-and-a-half-year-old boy that Agent Pease had recommended be sent to uh, Mrs. Hunt in Portland because she wants the child. Well, the state ultimately didn't do that. Instead, uh, at the age of three, they sent him to the main school for the feeble-minded separated him from his mother. Willie spent his entire life at the school and died there at the age of 19. Lottie, who I said was released, uh, this is actually a picture of her from 1997. Uh, she lived until 1997. She died at the age of 103. Uh, she died in, the, in an Augusta nursing home. She uh, married twice, but never had any children. She often talked about growing up on Malaga. Um, we talk about it fondly, remembering clam digging and her friends and, and cousins there. She often talked of having American Indian heritage, not uh, African-American heritage. 
And to her dying day, she denied ever having been a resident at the main school for the feeble-minded. After the eviction, lots of community members sort of scattered to wherever they could set up home in, in towns nearby. Here you can see John Eason in 1934. He set up home in Cundy's Harbor, which is part of Brunswick. Uh, what I love about this photo, first of all, I love the fact that he's got his dog sitting on his lap. It's great. Um, but also, if you look in the picture behind him, that's his house from Malaga Island. So either that's actually the structure or he replicated it when he got to, to Cundy's Harbor. I'm not sure, but that is exactly the same house that he had on Malaga. Malaga Island today is a nature preserve. It's owned uh, and maintained by the Maine Coast Heritage Trust. It's actually open to the public. So if you can get yourself over there, you can do it by canoe, kayak, you know, whatever. Uh, if you can get yourself there, it's actually a great place to visit. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, and Maine Coast Heritage Trust has a lovely nature trail that goes around the edge of the island. I would just recommend um, stay on the trail because off of the trail, a lot of the island is covered in poison ivy. So you just wanna be careful, uh, but it is a beautiful, beautiful place. Several of us um, uh, have continued to be involved even after the exhibit, after the, um, um, you know, after a lot of this news has, has come out about Malaga. Uh, we actually put together a memorial to the people from Malaga Island at the cemetery at Pineland. Um, we wanted to recognize the people who were buried there, uh, who they were and what their stories were. Uh, so we did erect a memorial um, in 2017. We also created a, uh, with the help of the state of Maine, uh, we created a scholarship fund for descendants of Malaga Island uh, residents who were evicted from the island. Um, the state of Maine uh, gave $350,000 uh, to be distributed out as a scholarship fund. Uh, and I'm very pleased to report we've already given all of that out, sent a lot of people to college, uh, which, was, which was wonderful. So for more information, if you'd like to learn more, um, there's some great resources online. Uh, the Maine State Museum still has uh, a lot of this material and photographs on their website. Uh, from the exhibit that we did in 2012. Um, there is a wonderful radio documentary online as well called Malaga Island, a story best left untold. And I highly recommend that because uh, you can hear from some of the descendants of the community as well. Uh, hear from them, their own words, their own perspective on what the story means to them. And we do at the Maine State Archives, uh, we've uh, actually purposely imaged and shared online many of the records of Malaga. Uh, so you can see the original documents, um, the records yourself, uh, just by visiting our website. Uh, we have the pauper records for the state of Maine, the executive council records that go through and, and made all these decisions for the Malaga Island community. And we have the Pineland patient records for most of the Marks family available online as well, including the eugenics charts and the intelligence tests and things like that they were given. And that's it. That's me. So I hope uh, this has been interesting. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So we did get one question in the comments. Um, did the state make wards of, of residents of any other islands or communities in Maine? Um, I have not seen evidence of entire communities like they did for Malaga. Um, that's not to say that um, it didn't happen, but I haven't found evidence of that yet. I've seen it more of like family units, but not community units. All right, and I'm gonna open the floor to anyone else. If they want to unmute themselves to ask any questions, you are now able to. Okay, I just wanted to tell Kate, thank you. This is Jan Isbell, very much. It was very interesting and I enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, and I think I will go to MalagaIslandMaine.org and look, well, yeah, it looks wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for, for tuning in. I really appreciate it. It was very good. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Do we have anyone else? I think we just have those two comments. All right. I learned so much <laughs> and I am very happy you 
you agreed to give a talk for us. Um, so Kate, I'm gonna say thank you. Thank you, this was yeah. great. Thank you all for attending.